Look at the beautiful scenery, Nicole. It's actually not, I know, it's, it's kind of surprising right there. Uh, but it is still pretty nice here in Portland, Oregon. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. This is Digital Trends Live, our daily show here from Digital Trends, where we bring you the tech headlines, we bring you interviews, we bring you all kinds of information every morning, broadcasting live right here on Twitch, Periscope, YouTube, and Facebook, which means we can talk to you directly. I want to say hi to Tony. I want to say hi to Perry. There's several different people who are joining in there right now, and we, we can uh, talk to you, so we want to take your comments and questions. Let's talk about what's on the docket today. Artificial intelligence is a big theme of today's show. We're going to be talking to, uh, let's take a look here, Ryan Welsh of Kindy. So Kindy is responsible for what's called the first explainable AI. So we're going to be talking to Ryan Welsh. He's going to be hopping on the show. And then later on, we've got another Ryan, Ryan Chin of Optimus Ride to talk about autonomous vehicles. And we've got some AI in the news as well that we're going to be discussing. And plus, I'm going to be taking this knife to this box, and we're gonna open it up and see what's inside. That sounds like a terrible idea when I said it out loud, but <laughs> we are unboxing a battle box today. The battle box is a monthly subscription box that you can get for outdoor enthusiasts. Um, and so we're gonna be taking, the, taking this thing open and seeing what's inside. I have no idea. Uh, you will find out live with us as we go through that. I'm Greg Nibbler, and joining me today it is Nicole Rainey. Hello, Nicole. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to not being here when you open this because I'm just imagining you going like. It's a lot of stabbing, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's kind of how I open presents. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's more. I'm more nervous about the knife than I am about anything else. This is. I feel like this is a bad. Like somebody's gonna regret this decision. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna use it anyway. I'm gonna use a knife live on camera. Well, from what I know about Battle Box, you might actually be getting a knife. Uh, hopefully, there's like a tourniquet in yeah. there or something, <laughs> like a <laughs> yeah, knife some, and a tourniquet. Something to save you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, say, say that's what's gonna happen. Exactly. Is I'm gonna hurt myself opening it, and then uh, everything else. But yeah, we'll be doing this later on in the show. So opening up a Battle Box live on the air, and we will see what is in there. I'll uh, slyly. Hide it down here and I'm gonna right remove now. Remove that from you. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> That's I need somebody to handle that part. All right, uh, let's talk about some news. So we every day, you know, we kind of take a look at what's trending in tech headlines, and this story is one that really caught a lot of people's eye, and it has to do with artificial intelligence, the theme of the day, and in particular, this comes from Nvidia. Now, Nvidia has created. I'm going to, I'll simplify it a little bit, but they created a derp, deep, derp, a deep <laughs> learning algorithm, a technical term, derp, a deep learning algorithm that will create portraits of fake people. Now that sounds like, okay, that doesn't seem like that's big of a, uh, that big of a deal, you know, compared to some of the different videos we've seen, but wait till you see this video. And so this has to do with um, the way this algorithm works is they can take different images of people and then combine them and they layer these onto basically creating a fake person. The video kind of explains it the most when you take a look at this thing, but this kind of technology is really, really creepy, but fascinating, and I'm, I, I'm not really sure what the applications would be for it, uh, but nonetheless, when you take a look at it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. So this is NVIDIA that came up with this, and they've been kind of at the forefront for a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of different things that they've been working on, and uh, there we go. There's, so taking a look at part of it, so they took four real people there at the top, and then they used that to create these fake images of people. Those are not real people on the bottom. Okay. I'm, I have so many questions. Yes, <laughs> there are so many questions. The, the biggest one being is I don't understand what the application for this would be. That's it. Uh, I, it's hard to think of like an, a positive application <laughs> that you would use for it. I'm sure there's probably something, mm -hmm. uh, but that is, uh, that, is, that is what they're using it for. So they're, they're saying they're using it as an example of being able to uh, layer things over, uh, over other images and how they could possibly use this. Like some of the positive they said were uh, creating photo apps uh, or photo apps that can maybe do adaptive adjustments. But at the same time, looking at this, it's hard to say 
where the real positive thing of it is. I guess it's kind of like the advanced version of that uh, Dave and Buster's uh, like photo booth that you had like way, way back in the day that would age your face. Right. Or uh, make you look younger or like merge your face with somebody else's. So yeah, I guess yeah. Just, that's just where we're at today. <laughs> the thing is like it's, it's a completely fake people. Mm -hmm. So you think about the applications when it comes to like deep fake. Deep fake is, you know, the videos where yeah. they basically make it look like somebody's, somebody's in the video and they're not. Um, the applications of that are pretty, pretty uh, unnerving, but nonetheless, that is where we're at. Like this is where we're at with this technology, and it's happening so fast. You know, that's that's kind of where one of the big things is just what are the applications for this. Taking a look in the chat, uh, Edward says, "See what we can do. Find a use later." Yeah, that's <laughs> that does kind of seem where where we're at with it, which can be a little bit of a scary thing, but nonetheless. That's where we're at. So this is uh, it's the, the technology coming out from NVIDIA when it comes to that. So you can watch that video. You can read about that at digitaltrends.com and uh, let us know what you think about this. Are you, do you like this kind of technology or is this scary? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be little, honest. Just like you said, like a little unnerving. A little bit of both. It seems like the best thing we can think of right now is it's an app or it could yeah. be an app. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's no commercial application yet that they've uh, come out with, but there we go. That is the NVIDIA video. That was one of the things that was trending today that we wanted to bring to you to see what you thought of that right here on Digital Trends Live. Let's go on to, let's do our Read em and Weep segment. This is where we read the comments that you provide to us. We uh, take a look every day. Jake kind of goes through these. I have not seen them myself. And we see what the people are saying on some of the different videos and posts that Digital Trends has. First up, we have Jason Mays. Jason, regarding thrill seekers will be able to pilot themselves in a giant drone as soon as 2019. I have read about this. It's pretty cool. I still don't know if I would want to be the first one to uh, hop in there to hop in one of these things. Uh, but Jason says, um, when the drones become big enough to pilot, it's not a drone anymore, it's just another copter at that point. Kind of, except I believe on this one though, the the uh, propellers are underneath. So it is kind of a drone. Mm -hmm. It's not really a helicopter, but yeah, I can, I can yeah, see what Yeah, but I guess the there. point of drone technology is to be remote, so you don't have to be. So you don't have to pilot it? Mm -hmm. Would you hop in something like this? Would you hop in? I a... would, but see, the thing that I'm thinking of right now is a drone, and I have not read this story, so uh -huh. you know, don't hold me to any of the facts that I'm just making up right now. Um, <laughs> so my question is, is whether or not I'm controlling the drone or is somebody else controlling the drone? I... If I'm controlling the drone, I'm going to say no, I don't have my pilot's license. <laughs> if somebody else is controlling the drone, yeah, why not? So you'd rather let somebody else take control? I have zero qualifications to drive anything other than a car. <laughs> like... <laughs> There's no, like, drone, I would just be, I would be feeling nervous just piloting a normal drone. Yeah. Let alone one that has me inside of it. Right. Okay. I think I would want to do it. I would just be, a, I'm, I'd want to see somebody else do it first, I think is what I would want to <laughs> do. Because you can watch me do it, and yeah. then you can do it. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So there we go. That is uh, the comment from Jason, I believe. So thank you, Jason. Let's go to Jose Coronel. Regarding Samsung 146-inch micro-LED hands-on review. So much for my retirement investment. TV, here I come. This has been getting a lot of, uh, a lot of comments, this particular article. I mean, 146-inch television. If you have space for a 146-inch television, you probably don't really need to worry about your retirement investment, I'm going to guess. No, yeah. That's kind of large? Yeah. Not to make any assumptions, but there's no way that thing is, like, fitting in my apartment. No. <laughs> Just one entire wall, like, yeah, having no, to it knock would, it up. No, it would have to fit, like, diagonally. <laughs> <laughs> we just have another wall inside of the apartment. Well, that is, I mean, it is a pretty amazing television. Actually, we've got some more television news we're going to be discussing in the tech headlines here in a few, because CES is coming up, the Consumer Electronics Show, and there's going to be a lot of television news that's going to come out at that. So we'll be talking about some more TV news in a bit. Jose, I understand, but yeah, I do not. That wouldn't even fit on the outside of my house. <laughs> like the more I think, uh, that's, no, there's no way. Although I'd be that guy in the neighborhood if I did, if I was mm -hmm. able to do that. That might Just be kind of. The, uh, it's like the upgrade from like the TV inside of the garage. Yeah. The TV on the outside of the entire The entire wall, wall of one house is a television. Uh, all right. Tony Branco regarding forget uh, painterly style transfers this AI creates realistic portraits of fake people and that's actually the video we were just showing you uh, Tony says that's good news for law enforcement apparently they love creating fake profiles on social media oh I mean I I, I get where he's going here but I didn't even think about the fact that catfishing oh the man implications of that like creating, right like creating fake people online and 
the photos and all that kind of stuff being so realistic that you convince somebody that you're real. That's there, terrifying. There is the application. That's the one we were looking for. Yeah, the actual, just yeah. to creep more people out. Catfish Pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that is that's a good point. I mean, you can if you can do that. I mean, I can think of like some things for like video games or stuff like that. You know, mm -hmm. the more realistic things. But uh, yeah, that is definitely definitely an application that people could be using. Thanks. So we're getting 19 yeah, more seasons. Out. Even more creeped out. <laughs> yeah, 20 more years of Catfish is going to be airing <laughs> right now. Uh, taking a look at some of the comments in here. Uh, taking a look here. Let's see. Actually, they could do it. I've seen them strip a boat in a city. Oh, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Uh, but uh, yeah, imagine some tweaker trying to steal a 146-inch television. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a rough, but I could see somebody trying to do it. I've had those meth head neighbors. All right, let's go on to our next comment. Uh, timepiece collect, timepiece collector. Wow, somebody who still collects timepieces. I didn't realize that was still a hobby. Uh, and you're online. So regarding digital trends, this robot can ice skate. Okay, it looks like we got a double comment here. So this isn't actually a video. Uh, there's a video that goes along with this that I, I didn't <laughs> snag it, but you can watch it at digital trends. And it's this robot. It looks kind of like a centipede-ish thing, but it's like a fin and this robot can, um, uh, essentially, I think it's autonomous. I'm not entirely sure, but it can go over. It can ice skate. It can go uh, slide over snow. It's like a robot eel, basically. Yeah. And it kind of uses these fins to be able to propel itself forward. Very. Uh, that is a much better description than I just did. <laughs> so that's why Nicole's on here. So yeah, and <clears throat> uh, timepiece collector just said, "Can it do my physics quiz tomorrow?" So that was on twelve fifteen. Coming back at twelve eighteen for the return. I didn't get a good result, in case you were wondering. Thank you. Sorry, timepiece collector. Timepiece collector, thank you for the update on that. Thanks for returning to comment. We do appreciate that. I need to follow, though. Did he get the robot to do his homework, or do the quiz, or did he just not do well in the quiz in general? That's a good point. And what was the quiz about? Timepiece, we have so many questions. Physics, he said. Physics. That is pretty, that's well, pretty vague. Well, it's vague. Kind of physics. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we need to narrow it down. So, uh, timepiece, thank you for commenting, and we hope to see your comments some more. All right, we've got Daisy Rivera. I feel like I've seen this name before. I feel like Daisy's commented before. This was on Facebook for our Digital Trends page regarding Ford's prototype Quiet Kennel uses noise-canceling tech to keep dogs stress-free. I, I did see this article, so it's essentially like a, a tent, you know, that you can keep your dog in and for, for your own dogs that are afraid of fireworks. Um, Daisy said, I need a big one for myself. That way I don't hear the loud music from my neighbors day and night. I can, I can respect that a lot. Uh, I used to have, I, speaking of the meth head neighbors, I did used to have some, uh, some neighbors that, was up, that would stay up very late mm -hmm. and then they would decide to play guitar terribly <laughs> at like three in the morning. And this is the kind of guy that, you know, would also mow his lawn at 3.30 in the morning too. Um, so yeah, I can, uh, I can appreciate wanting to block that, uh, block that noise. So out. Daisy, hopefully the loud music you're hearing is not their own music and just music from the radio. Yeah, not creating their own songs yeah. <laughs> as they're going through. That's what uh, my neighbor fancied himself a real musician, and he was. And only at 3 a.m. Only at 3 a.m. after, um, oh, I don't know, a day of sleeping and whatever else he was doing over there <laughs> and tearing apart copper wire. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one, Daisy. Appreciate that. Matthew Collop regarding Lincoln revives its coolest ever design feature for limited edition Continental. But there's a pillar and roof. Such a shame. I haven't seen this article. Yeah. I haven't followed um, up. Nicole. Uh, not you sure possibly this know no. what this is, so it's a mystery for us as well. Matthew, I'm just going to say you're absolutely right. Such a shame, and uh, we, we clearly agree with you 100%. So uh, there it is. Oh, there's the picture. Thank you very much. All right, so we've got that. Oh, that's the one with the suicide doors. Oh. So I do appreciate that, uh, that addition. So never mind. My comment rescinded, Matthew. I disagree with you. Uh, I think that looks pretty cool to me. Yeah, I think he's pretty cool. What did it, what was his comment? Exactly? Uh, his comment was it had a pillar and a roof. Such a shame. I'm I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm a little confused. I'm confused on like it too. The, the the you know like the door separation in the middle of it. I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I don't know Matthew. what Matthew was saying. Let us know so. what you were, what is, let us know what you meant. Yes, exactly. Well, Matthew, thank you for commenting right there for our read em and weep segment of today's show. Uh, all right, I, th I think we're, we're out of read them and weep comments, so let's go on to some more news now. Let's discuss some Elon Musk news. <laughs> so we've got Elon Musk, uh, always, always part of, uh, part of digital chats here, at least he has been uh, lately, just because we've been having so much of him on. 
And it was because yesterday the Boring Company had their test of the Boring Tunnel. This is the one, I think it's 1.1 mile stretch that their 1.14 mile, excuse me, if you're correcting at home, uh, stretch of the tunnel that he has bored underneath Hawthorne, California, starting at SpaceX, going to a different location. And they had the test yesterday, so we actually finally got some footage of this. And it is, uh, they showcased a Tesla, of course, that was being used. It lowers down in a um, kind of an elevator shaft and then is put into the tunnel. And I believe it went about 50 miles an hour. Uh, Tesla Model X SUV modified to fit onto a special track. Some of the key things of it are the way the Tesla worked, the way he's proposing, you know, if this were to be implemented in cities as an actual transportation option, cars would be modified to have skates on the bottom of them. And so when they lower down in, these skates pop out and then it rides along the rails and is pushed. It just still seems so complicated, but I'm at least mildly hopeful about this because uh, like Elon Musk is quoted in the our article on Digital Trends, it could, it, it could represent and quote, actual solution to the soul crushing burden of traffic, which I feel like is the most accurate description ever of traffic. Yeah. A soul crushing. Soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, if this is, if this is something that's actually a, uh, a, something that they could actually implement, yeah, I like that idea. However, I think it's we're a long ways away from it just because of the fact that it's it's expensive. Although in the long run, he's claiming that it's going to be less expensive. I believe this was ten million dollars though to construct a one point one four mile demonstration tunnel. Mm -hmm. You know, and the other thing that he was talking about is he's he believes that eventually, if they implemented this, like every office building could have their own. Elevate, you know, shaft to bright, to uh, drop down. But what we discussed top. a couple or a week or two ago was the regulations behind some of this aren't really defined yet. So, yep. you know, how do you affect? How does that affect the infrastructure if every office building has its own loop to somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's a good point. And Marcelo just said very claustrophobic. Yeah, it, it would be <laughs> claustrophobic. Although, yeah. I mean, if if it got me out of sitting in traffic, you know, uh, you know, wherever it is, especially in LA, yeah. Yeah, barreling down a dark tunnel at 150 miles per hour for 30 minutes or being right. stuck in L.A. traffic for an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, another comment. Both sound terrifying. Yeah, both, both, do, both do sound terrifying. Uh, another comment referencing our consistent ploy to get uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson into a ring so they can fight each other. I forgot about that. It is. Uh, Edward just brought up uh, Richard Branson needs to up his crazy billionaire game. Oh, I see. Yeah. So there Hello, we go. Branson. Yeah, so Branson, you know, the ball's in your court. Come up with something crazy that we can talk about. All right, there we go. Let's go on to, uh, I think we, got, we have time for one, maybe two more stories. And then just to update you, we're going to have Ryan Welsh on here in just a few to talk, about, uh, to talk about AI, to talk about the first explainable AI from Kindy. So we'll have Ryan here to uh, discuss that. Before we get to that, though, we, I did say we we're going to talk about some more television news. And with CES coming up, we're going to be hearing a lot about televisions, I assume. And in particular, rollable OLED televisions. We did talk about this last year at CES. LG showcased um, a rollable OLED television, but it wasn't one that we were going to be able to sell. It wasn't even on the show floor, I don't think. It was, uh, we had, but we have lots of video and coverage of it at Digital Trends. Well, now the rumors are, as things start to get leaked out before CES, I don't think companies necessarily want this to happen, but this is the rumor coming from Forbes, or Bloomberg, excuse me, uh, originally posted this as far as what I can see. And they're saying that there will be a 65-inch television a rollable OLED television from LG that will be available commercially next year. So this is in contrast to the 146-inch television, yes. which would take up your entire entire living room or outside of your house. Yeah. So this is something that uh, still gives you all the vision and scope of whatever you're watching, but right. it's a bit more compact, right? Yep. So it's it's actually rollable. So this would actually yeah roll up. Um, the way it would probably work, you wouldn't actually be able to physically do it yourself, but mm. it's more like a, they like a reference kind of, or kind of like a, like a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Garage door. Yeah. Yeah. Like a garage door rolling up. Uh, there's kind of an example of what they showed before. So that one would stand up straight and then roll back into that box. So it would roll back in by itself. I'm, I mean, I, I like this idea. I think it's neat, but until I can actually get it to where I can physically roll it out and like roll it up in like a poster and put it in my backpack, you know? <laughs> 
That's you when I'm on traveling television. Yeah, when I'm traveling television. So that way, you know, <laughs> my, uh, my my ADD is always satisfied because I always have the television there. Uh, uh, I love uh, the idea that like instead of a, a yoga mat you're carrying around yeah. like, on your back, and you're just like, oh, you're practicing. You going to work out? No, I'm, I'm going to go watch Netflix in the park. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I would totally watch Netflix in the park. All right, so so that's one of the the rumors though is that we will finally get one of those commercially next year. For those of you watching, do you want one of these? Do you want a rollable OLED television uh, like this one, the one that actually rolls back up into its own box? Uh, do you want the poster one like I have? Um, <laughs> you know what my biggest concern is? Is like the, where my TV is right now, I don't have to worry about decorating that wall of my apartment. Oh, right? good point. Yeah, so I, think, I, I like this idea, right? Because you, uh -huh. you know, obviously like save space and maybe it doesn't make the television sort of the center of your living room. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times now, like all of our furniture and everything, is facing towards the TV. Yeah. So if you have something, a different setup, and you can kind of roll your TV down, maybe you're not as like tech focused. Uh, but then I have to get some art to put on that wall. That is true. All of my couches and everything are just facing a blank wall. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I mean, is this just like the updated version also of, you know, like in the 80s, uh, 80s shows where it's like the rich guy would press the button and the walls would open up and his television would be behind there? Oh, 100%. So We're, getting kind of We're getting closer. We're getting closer to, to that. To creepy AI, uh, <laughs> more catfishing, but also a billionaire yeah. TV doomsday bunker situation. Yes. All right. And we and we talked about Elon Musk and Richard Branson, so I think we covered everything here. Yeah. That's it. I think that's, <laughs> that's your tech headlines right there. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. So we have lots coming up on this show today. So I did mention we're going to be coming back with Ryan Welsh in a few. Also, we're going to have Ryan Chin later on to talk about Optimus Ride and autonomous vehicles. I'm going to be opening up a battle box, a battle box right here on the show. I have no idea what's inside. You're going to find out with me. We'll open that up in about... Oh, 10, 15 minutes or so, but we're going to go to a quick break here. I want to say thank you to Nicole. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for hopping in here. I guess and I should uh, give this back to you, and good luck. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. Yes, what will happen with this? Uh, I'll hurt myself. So, uh, so we're going to go to a quick break, and then we're going to be joined back with Ryan Welsh of Kindy to talk about the first explainable AI right here on Digital Trends Live. Continuing back with more digital trends live, artificial intelligence is something we love talking about here, and increasingly, it is such a part of technology, no matter what facet you're in. And we have an expert on artificial intelligence from Kindy. We're now joined by Ryan Welsh. Hello, Ryan. Oh, oh, I don't think I can quite hear you. Okay, and we are joined now by Ryan Welsh. Ryan, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. There we go. See, we need the AI to fix this first. Um, so let's That's talk. <laughs> so, Ryan, thanks for hopping on here today. And I want to talk about a lot of the things, you know, that your company is doing. So let's first go to this. Why don't we talk about what Kindy is and then maybe get into talking about the first explainable AI or whatever order you want to do with that. 
Yeah, sure. So first, first the, the, the company. So we're an AI startup based in San Mateo, and we build explainable AI products for government, financial services, and healthcare. And we exist because those industries can't use purely machine learning, uh, statistical machine learning techniques, because those techniques are generally black boxes. So effectively, how do you build systems that can get past regular regulatory requirements and also uh, just gain trust of, of users in those industries? Okay, so it's just kind of to help everybody out there, you know, in, in getting to understand this. And that's the thing. I think for AI, for a lot of people, it's such a broad concept that it is, it is a difficult thing, you know, to, to really wrap your mind around what it is and where it's going. Um, how, did you, how did this company come to be? Like, how did you get this started? Yeah, I, I got to start. I was, I was, I was working in uh, so I have a graduate degree in, in quantitative finance. I was working for a law firm during a financial crisis, and effectively, we had to read a bunch of information to help our clients get uh, uh, unwind a bunch of esoteric credit derivatives. And in three days, I had to read an amount of information that when I left for business school three years later, I was still reading. So, uh, effectively, how do you build machines that help us consume that information and ultimately make decisions faster uh, instead of taking three years? Maybe take the actual three days. So um, when you work with these systems, they don't really work well on, on language, and they can't explain to you while they're, why they're making recommendations, why they're bringing back certain search results. So kind of bringing all that together, um, which is why I started Kindy in June 2014, um, and why we've been going gangbusters ever since, because the kind of hypothesis of you need explainable systems, you need it to work on natural language, um, you know, we've, we've been able to bring that to market. Uh, that's that's actually a really great concept, and that is something that I think is going to be necessary going forward. You know, the more complicated this gets, if we can't understand it, that there's something. I think there's some kind of a maybe a human element in there where it's like we wanted to. We want the AI to explain it to us in our language. You know, not just yeah. Here's what's so, here's, yeah. Here's what's so interesting is the fact that you have me on and are asking the question why is exactly why we need it. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it, it's, I, you know, I've been, I've been doing a, a talk recently where I get up on stage and I say that uh, for AI to thrive, it needs to be explainable. And then I walk off stage and everyone's <laughs> like, wait a minute, he has, he has 30 minutes. And I joke that if I was a neural network, I would just walk off stage. And, and there's something about being, you know, what makes us human is this uh, ability to ask why and this desire to ask why. And every time someone makes a statement, your first reply is why? And it's because we want to interrogate um, and understand the, pe the person's belief system and their, their logic so that we can ultimately determine whether we believe them, whether we adhere to, to their, their principles, and ultimately we can, we can gain trust with that individual. And if we don't have machines that can provide that, then it just really won't be able to fit within our you know, workflow as human beings. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to take things at face value. You want to know exactly, yeah, how that happened. That's that's a good point. I mean, I didn't even think about it that way, but just human nature. Like, okay, cool. You told me this. How how did you find this out? You know, how did you determine this? Yeah. What was your process? Well, what are um, I know some of the things that we wanted to talk about here too, because you had brought this up. Is what are the top two issues for enterprises specific to AI? Yeah, the the the, the top two. Well, number one is explainability. There was a great yeah. article. Um, recently, where IBM did a survey of 5,000 businesses, and 82% of them wanted to adopt AI, but the number one hurdle was explainability. The executives and business unit owners in those companies didn't feel that AI was sufficiently transparent for them to for it to fit within their their workflows. And then the other one is is that modern techniques are overly reliant on a lot of labeled data. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges is you know, when any AI startup or even a, a, a incumbent company goes into work with an enterprise, the first question they have is, you know, where's all your data? Is it clean? Is it labeled? Um, is there 50,000 or in some cases 500,000 or a million examples that I can learn from? And the answer to that question is typically no. So that's why you see a lot of the da data labeling companies doing a lot of, of work now um, labeling that data. So they are the two biggest, biggest hurdles is because with that label, um, aspect of it. It just takes so long to deploy these systems that, you know, two years in, you're not getting any value yet because you haven't even labeled or trained the, the system yet. That's, uh, yeah, that's got to be a, a very big industry right now is going through and relabeling all that data. You figure years and years and years of collecting that with no actual way to have that be available as, as an asset for 
for artificial intelligence to even learn off of it. And I also feel like a lot of companies are incorporating the name AI into things, but you know, back to that, they don't really know what AI is. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, well, we got AI in that thing. You know, but what is AI? Yeah, yeah, there's, 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 uh, and there's both two sides to that too, because uh, uh, CEOs will tell their executives, go buy me AI. <laughs> yeah, <right? And> <laughs> I need to get some of that. The executives come in and be like, do you have it? Because I want to buy it. And uh, <laughs> of course, you know, people are going to say, of course, I, I, I have it for you. So, I mean, I, I think, I think any, I, I think AI has, has its ability for machines to learn, um, but also to reason. And I think people a lot uh, forget that next step. Um, because this current wave of AI that we're seeing, these statistical machine learning techniques are phenomenal at learning from data, but they don't reason very well. And I'm talking about reasoning in the historic symbolic AI sense of inductive, deductive, abductive, analogical reasoning, these kind of things that we can do as human beings. So I think of AI as, as this, this ability to, to learn from data, but then to also reason with that data or reason with the knowledge that you acquire from that data and put that knowledge together in new and novel ways and create ultimately new knowledge. How far away do you think we are from, from that exact kind of system? Uh, we're, we're very far away from artificial general intelligence. Uh, you know, I, there was an uh, article where, where I think it was Kurzweil saying 2029, and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, Brooks uh, was saying 22, 2200. Uh, I, I put it out there, there pretty far. I mean, if you're in the industry and you work with AI systems, um, you understand how limited they are, specifically around um, sensory motor um, and natural language understanding or comprehension of, of language. Um, systems are very good at parsing sentences, but not really good at understanding the semantics and the pragmatics of, of language. That's a, that's an interesting perspective, especially coming from somebody you know in the industry, because I I feel like a lot of people are worried you know we're going to reach singularity and the AI is going to take us over in a few years, but you're, you're saying that's not going to happen for a while. Yeah, no, not not at all, and and I, I think this is this is where the industry gets gets in in trouble is because I think the breakthroughs that we have have been phenomenal, yet. Uh, compared to the hype that we're throwing behind it, they, it's just it's just not there. So we're like, the, the hype is exceeding the actual applications of, of these these technologies, and that kind of mismatch, I think, will ultimately send uh, certain techniques um, into a, a AI winter. Um, and I think that the people that are going to prevail are going to be the the companies that realize that AI is a feature of a product, not the product itself. So you got to go in, you got to solve real business problems or uh, people problems and ultimately have AI be a feature of the product, not the product itself. Very good point. Well, Ryan, I want to thank you, you know, for having a, uh, for hopping on the show here today with us. And where can people follow Kindy and, and follow everything that you do as a company? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kindy.com is a, a great place to check in on our uh, AI research uh, white papers that we have out. Uh, Kindy Tech uh, Twitter. Uh, and of course, on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, so that's, that's everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Ryan Wells joining us right here on Digital Trends Live. Have a great day. How you too, bye. All right. Thank you, everybody, too, for tuning in to Digital Trends Live. This is what's fun about this show is we get to have conversations like this. We learn something. I certainly learned a lot right there. And since we're broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitch, Periscope, and YouTube, we can take your comments as they come through as well. So I definitely want to see what, uh, what people think. Let's see, Tony says, AI reporting the news should be something to work on and code. Yeah, I've, I've heard about the AI you know, taking over news. There, there are some actual organizations that are doing that. There's a video from China where they have a, um, basically an AI uh, rendering of a person reading the news. Uh, I would prefer that it's still me or maybe I am the AI right now. Maybe I'm that advanced, I don't know. Uh, all right, here on Digital Trends Live, one of the other fun things we get to do is sometimes we unbox things. And today we are going to be unboxing this. This is called BattleBox. So what BattleBox is, is it's a subscription service for uh, Survivor fans. I mean, people who are into uh, Survivor uh, types of things. Let me get the actual thing here. So a subscription uh, box for outdoor enthusiasts, for Survivorists. There's all kinds of different things. It's called the BattleBox Survival and Tactical Gear. 
gear. And this service, the way it works is if you subscribe to it, there's four different subscription levels. And uh, every month they send you a box. It's a mystery box. We don't know what's in here. I have no idea. But what we're going to do is open this up. And we're gonna take a look at this and we're gonna see what we have in this box. So um, what I'm gonna do, open this up. I've got a knife. This uh, seems like a bad idea. Let's walk through and see what we get in this box. So the best way, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna slice this. Again, seems like a terrible idea. Um, okay. <laughs> I think you can tell by the way I'm handling this knife. I'm clearly a survivor myself. Uh, all right. Let's see what we get. So this is delivered monthly. I think this is the, uh, the, the pro box. So uh, this is what we get. All right, so we're opening it up. Let's take a look here. Oh, all right, there's some kind of flyer here. Okay, it's an advertisement for it. So this is the Pro Series, uh, $99.99 cost uh, with $170 value. So it's saying there's $170 worth of stuff in here. Let's see what we get. All right, first up. Uh, what do we have here? It stops bleeding fast, see? Okay, when I had originally talked about this this morning with the knife, this would have been wor worked out very well for me. So, uh, first aid for minor cuts, scrapes, and abrasions. Um, oh, it looks like you can even, uh, stop some nosebleeds. So, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that, you know, that's, that's cool. That's something I could definitely use. I am prone to accidents. So, all right, we got there. Let's go ahead and keep on going through here. A carbon scraper. What is this? Oh, okay. So it says it's got a, a scraper, a knife sharpener, and a flint rod in there. So I'm assuming you can like start a fire with this and then um, sharpen your knife at the same time. I, I don't really know, but that's, you know, either way, this is something that, uh, oh, I see here in the back. It kind of gives it a little bit more of a description. So yeah, you can start a fire with it and, uh, and sharpen your knife up. So uh, that's cool. So that comes in here. So we're already surviving. We can cut ourselves and then stop the bleeding all at the same time. Um, oh boy, I don't know what's in here, but I can tell you right now it says real steel on it. I feel like I feel like we're gonna get something awesome in this. So again, this is the battle box that we're opening up here. What is going on? All right, I think there's. Oh, we got a knife. Yep, we got a knife. All right, so this is <laughs> this is actually a really heavy knife. Uh, looks like a leather sheath for it. Um, pulling a blade out on camera. Uh, let's see what. Oh boy. It's like stuck in here. How am I supposed to do this? This is, this is such a recipe, terrible recipe. Um, it must be a kind of, some kind of a locking mechanism. This is probably not how you're supposed to open this. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna have to show me how to open this. Okay, so, okay, we're gonna have some, Mike's gonna come over here from behind. Wow, do I ever feel manly right now. Uh, Mike, show us how we, how we get this knife open. Okay, if you can't do it either, See, okay, so it wasn't just me. It's there's some kind of a, you know, dummy lock on it that we're not able to figure out. All right, well, there's a knife in there. In theory, you could be able to use this. All right, this is what I get for doing this live. Uh, I will figure out how to open up this knife at some point. All right, there's a knife. <laughs> the, the, the sheath is awesome. All right, let's continue on. What do we have here? All right, Gerber. All right, so that must be something pretty good. Speed, which I could use that knife right now if I could open up, that up, but you know. All right, let's go. Th let's take a look. It's another knife. This is a box of knives. We have a lot of knives in here. So uh, this looks like some kind of a, huh. See, I, I need a knife to open the knife. Uh, but nonetheless, that is a, this is, looks like some kind of a, I, I don't know, a ninja knife. We'll call it a ninja knife. Uh, there's a knife right here. So we got two knives. Two knives so far in the battle box. Let's go through here. It's being noted by Keelan. So glad there was a childproof lock on that knife. Yes, clearly uh, I need help. All right, what do we have here? This is uh, coming, so this is Lord and Field Outfitters. Um, blaze your own trail. If it's not a knife, I'm gonna be very disappointed. Uh, let's see here. Oh, what is going? Oh, glasses, safety glasses. Definitely something I would need. Definitely something I would need to use. You got a, several different festive colors here for your safety glasses in the battle box. So, uh, so yeah, we've got uh, we got a lot, of, a lot of different ones to choose from. Whatever what your uh, what your flavor of the day is. All right, a couple more things here left in this this one. Again, this is the pro version of the battle box. I don't know what this is. I'm gonna go ahead and rip it open here. Um, okay, another thing from Mordenfield. 
Let's see what we've got. Oh, it's a dry bag. Dry bags, super useful. All right, that's actually really cool. Uh, dry bag, so you, you know, you've got your whole outfit here. Guess what? There's another knife. So actually this is, <laughs> this is a full on saw, excuse me. Yeah, we can, uh, but you know, I'm sure you could use it as a knife in some factor. So you are fully stocked on blades when it comes to the battle box. So you're, you're good to go on there. Uh, last couple of things that we have in here. Let's see, parse, okay, wires, cables. Oh, uh, it's just cable ties, hook and loop straps to, to keep your knives organized. So you got that right there. Uh, that's from BattleTac. So again, and this is the battle box. Uh, last thing in here, what, uh, button lamps. Oh, they're lamps. Okay, that's pretty cool. So button lamps, it shows, uh, you know, you can organize your closet right there. And according to this, if you're out in the, you know, surviving and you still need to organize your clothes, uh, you can use these. So yeah, button lamps, indoor, outdoor, waterproof, shockproof. This is what we found here. Again, this is the <coughs> battle box. Uh, there's uh, my collection that we've seen here. We've got all kinds of different things. And actually these look like they're pretty quality products. I will figure out how to open this knife at some point. Um, I need instructions to come with a knife apparently for, for myself. Most people would be able to handle that. But this is the Battle Box. Battlebox.com is where you can go and subscribe to this. This is, uh, this is actually really cool. So survival and tactical gear that you can get delivered to you every month. And uh, you can go there at Battlebox.com and check that out. All right, let's go ahead and go take a break. We'll clear the knives off. We're gonna come back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live where we are going to be talking to Ryan Chin about Optimus. So we're gonna discuss some more autonomous vehicles here on the show today. We're going to find out what they're doing, how they're incorporating that into the world and into what they're, what they're involved in. We're really excited to talk to him. So let's take a break. Back here in just a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Now with more knives. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Thanks everyone for tuning in live every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you tech headlines and great interviews. And today we're gonna to be talking about some autonomous vehicles. Autonomous cars are something I think we're all excited for and we wanna know when we're gonna be getting them, how it works. And we've got Ryan Chin on right now from Optimus Ride to discuss this and how that all works. Ryan, thank you so much for hopping on today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show. So Ryan, let's walk through here and talk about Optimus Ride. Let's just start from there and explain what Optimus Ride is and what you do as a company. Yeah, we're a self-driving vehicle company based in Boston. Uh, and what we do is develop fully autonomous vehicles, so no driver in the loop. And we focus on what we call level four autonomy, which is basically fully autonomous vehicles that operate in a limited area or geofenced area and under a certain speed. So you can imagine a neighborhood in a city a campus, a, a university campus, a, a, a planned community, for example, big master plan community, a sea, seaport, airport, those type of communities where you can deploy autonomous vehicles very safely today 
uh, and, and, and basically provide uh, mobility for folks that need first and last mile transportation. That's great. All, all of those applications. I actually kind of want to discuss uh, a lot of those because we want to get to where these are deployed right now. But for when it comes to Optimus Rides, like how did this company start? How did you get to this point? Because it's, it's clearly it's not something you just jump right into and be at a level four autonomy. Um, how, did, how did we get to this point? Yeah, well, the founders all come from MIT. Uh, okay. We all worked on self-driving vehicles for more than a decade. Uh, two of our co-founders were part of the Urban Challenge, the DARPA Urban Challenge, the Federal Government Challenge 10 years ago to develop autonomous vehicles. Uh, and so we spent over a decade developing technology and perfecting it. And of course, since uh, 10 years ago, there's been lots of advances in computer vision and, and, and processing speed and, and how uh, you can sense the world, algorithmic improvements as well. And so we started the company three years ago and we built up uh, you know, our own testing facility. You see this video of our, our vehicle testing in, in our indoor test track. And we've been deploying these uh, vehicles in the seaport of Boston, as well as a number of our client sites. Let's talk about that. Some of the different places where you've deployed these. So I, I, do, I do know you had mentioned you know, Boston's seaport. I mean, that's, uh, that's a huge, huge uh, uh, undertaking. That's a huge industry right there with Boston's seaport. What do your Optimus rides do there? Yeah, so in the seaport, we do a lot of testing here in the innovation district. It's a, you know, it's an area that uh, has uh, double articulated buses, it has bicycle messengers, it has, uh, you know, seafood delivery trucks everywhere. And we, we use it as a proving ground to test our technology. And in this area, it's limited. It's not the entire city. It's sort of bounded by water on, on a couple sides. Uh, and we want to provide mobility essentially from the various points within the seaport to things like mass transit, for example, South Station, major uh, subway line uh, access, or perhaps to the bus line that is here too. A lot of folks have challenges trying to get from one place to, uh, within the zone to, to another. So we do a lot of testing there, uh, but we also deployed in other locations as well. So we have a, a client that is just south of the city. It's connected to the commuter rail. And in that community, we provide mobility within a 1,550 acre site which is more of a suburban uh, level of density. But over there, we provide mobility to the commuter rail so that folks can be dropped off in the morning to, do, to the commuter rail, take the train uh, into the city, and then we pick them up at nighttime and bring them home. So I, I love that kind of taking that last step, you know, that people need to get from one place to one place and, and, and covering something that maybe wasn't covered before. What are some of the challenges of getting this implemented? Because I, I mean, regulation wise, it's gotta be so much stuff that has to, that you have to go through. Uh, what are the challenges you're facing right now? Yeah, I think the challenges is generally in, in the whole industry, self-driving vehicles, really hard problem, right? It's super, yeah. super. And there's a lot of people that feel, a lot of experts feel like this will take a really long time. And I agree with them in some areas. There's going to be some markets that materialize uh, in the near term. So, for example, you know, you, uh, long haul trucks, for example, long haul trucks that cross the country. You can see that materializing quite early. Perhaps last and first mile delivery uh, robots that are going slower speed. That can happen, too. I think for us, in terms of urban driving, that's going to take a while. It's pretty hard to drive in a snowstorm through Times Square. Uh, which is actually, you know, a pretty tough task to be able to drive from there all the way up to Harvard Square up here in the Boston area. That's pretty hard to do. We think that's going to take some time before you get there. However, if you constrain the problem and let's say let's let's do this below 30 miles per hour, which most cities are actually you know, pushing for uh, this whole 25 mile per hour speed regime mm -hmm. uh, or less in, ter in terms of you know, reducing fatalities or geofencing it and putting it into a specific area in which you can operate, you can safely deploy autonomous vehicles there. And the regulations are, you know, are, are different depending on the state that you're in. So some states are very open, others are not. It really depends uh, on the location. Uh, we're able to deploy here in Boston because we work with the DOT and we work with the city and we have permits to do that. Other states don't require that. So it really depends on where the market's going. But from our view, geofenced areas are by default safer and also, uh, you basically reduce some of the edge cases so you can actually get to a real product much sooner rather than later. That, that makes sense, kind of taking it from a smaller, that smaller scale, like you said, the geofencing. Before we have you know, an autonomous vehicle that's going to drive, drive me from here, Portland to New York, that's going to be quite a, quite a feat you know, for something that's going to be used in, the, in like an unregulated manner, where, where basically I could just order that up. You know, it's not under a, a strict testing um, situation. So... You know, you've got these in the Boston Seaport right now. What's the expansion plan for Optimus Ride? Where do you go from here? What's, what's your next step? Yeah, we have, over, we have over 20 different clients right now. 
uh, many of whom have you know, dozens to hundreds of sites that they would like to deploy to. So our plan is to go beyond uh, Boston area, uh, even within 2019, we're gonna be spreading across the entire country to a number of sites uh, that we're gonna be announcing over the next couple months. And basically every two months we'll be adding a new site uh, to, 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 uh, to our deployments. And the idea is to be able to scale that technology to multiple sites in multiple regions uh, over the course of the next one to two years. Uh, in fact, each of these markets are pretty interesting because you wanna be able to have a deployment in a planned community. You wanna have a deployment in a campus, which is a very different customer base. They all have different similar speeds and similar level of complexity, but each of the customer bases have different needs. Uh, some are actually traveling inside that area uh, and some are traveling out and some are doing both. And so you wanna be able to develop the right kind of product for each of those. And technologically, it starts with basic autonomy. If you can't get basic autonomy to work, well, you're not gonna be able to do any of those very interesting sort of additional services that, that a lot of AV companies are promising. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, there's, it's such a complex thing and there are so many different factors that go into it as far as figuring out what it's going to do when it's out there, you know, autonomously riding. Do you have, do you have, um, you, so yours are level four, so they're operating on their own. There's not an actual person in there controlling yeah, it. Yeah, so it depends on the state, right? So in mm -hmm. Massachusetts, you are required to have a safety operator gotcha. uh, on board. States aren't, but they are designed and they are operational uh, fully autonomously. And you could imagine, you know, as this starts to grow, you know, uh, scale, that you will get to a point where you will have remote monitoring of vehicles, right? You have some command center. We're actually designing that now, where you can think of it almost like an air, air traffic control tower. And you do that with airplanes today. One controller will see 25, 30 planes, right? Flying mm -hmm. around skies. You also imagine that you will still need to have uh, op remote operators or remote monitoring of the system where you have one person watching 25 vehicles or 50 vehicles. That's where the economies of scale and the, and the unit economics starts to work tremendously in the favor of, of, of self-driving vehicles. But you can also imagine that, like today, look at today's elevators, right? Modern elevator today is level four. There's still a button that you call in case of emergency, right? And so the same thing will have to happen also for self-driving vehicles. That is a really good comparison. I didn't even think about that. You know, just to know, you used to have an elevator operator for, for every elevator, you know, you, when you would take that. But yeah, you don't need that anymore. Well, I, I mean, I think we're all very fascinated with autonomous vehicles, and I think there's a lot of advantages that are going to come. And we need people like you working on these problems, you know, to figure out how to implement this and how the best way is to utilize them. And Ryan, how can people follow Optimus Ride? What's the best way to do that? Well, the best way to, to follow us is to go to our website, optimusride.com. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn page. Uh, and we publish quite regularly uh, events, partnerships, uh, deployments that we're doing, uh, you know, uh, advances in our technology. Uh, we, we do a lot of that. And, and primarily that's, that's because it's important to get the message out about how self-driving vehicles are going to actually happen. Uh, there's lots of prognostications of how it could happen. But the reality is it's a pretty tough problem. So you have to start somewhere. And we think that starting somewhere realistic is actually the way to then increase your ability to go to more environments over time. Right, I was gonna ask, you know, since autonomy and autonomous vehicles are such a huge part of you know, the tech industry now, are you gonna be down at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, showcasing this? Yeah, we will be at, at CES. We've been at CES for the last several years. We won't be showcasing anything. People will have to come up to Boston uh, to see our vehicles. Uh, we're there to really you know, look, at, look at what's going on at, at CES and look at all the new technology that's coming out, particularly on sensing, right? Those are pretty yeah. interesting new, 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 new components coming out. That's gonna drive a lot of the, the, the processes. Of course, from our point of view, we're a full stack software developer, right? We don't make cars, we don't make sensors. We take all of that from vendors and partners and integrate that into what we do, which is essentially autonomous control planning uh, perception, those those areas which are very, very difficult to do. And you need basically rocket scientists <laughs> as yeah. part of your team uh, to create that. You need roboticists, you need machine learning folks, you need, you need, you need all of that to figure it all out. And the biggest challenge is how do you do, how do you drive through space with irrational beings in control? That's really one of the biggest challenges in self-driving is how do you do that? And so certainly by constraining the problem somewhat, you can start to tackle that problem in a much more safe and controlled way. It also gets you the kind of data density that you need in order to actually solve the problems. And that's why we think our approach is actually a really good way to do things. 
I think that's a you know, it's a very good point. You need so much data input to understand, you know, what how to program this, how to how it can understand how the autonomous vehicle can understand what's going on. And there's just so many factors to it. And I think uh, it's it's really really exciting stuff. And thanks for hopping on the show today, Ryan. You know, we really appreciate you talking to us. We'd love to check back in later on and and see where you're at and see what's going on with Optimus Ride. And if I make it up to Boston, maybe uh, hop in one of the vehicles for a ride. Yeah, it? definitely. Uh, we're, we we've taken passengers. We've taken the secretary transportation on our vehicle uh, and as we expand out you know out to the west coast and other locations you'll just be able to, to grab one there as well and we're happy to have uh, have you uh, have you uh, have a ride and, and, and an optimus ride fantastic ryan thank you so much ryan chin from optimus ride right here on digital trends live and thank you everyone for tuning into digital trends live this show is fun Every day, we talk to so many different people, and we broadcast live here talking to you. And that's one of the most important parts of this show is that we are live every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you things. So today, you know, uh, we had uh, Nicole in here for the headlines talking about NVIDIA, and uh, that's really, really interesting yet creepy AI that they have developed. Uh, We did talk to uh, Ryan Welsh. And I mean, it was definitely, you know, an artificial intelligence type of show today. We talked to Ryan Welsh about their explainable AI and how that is working. And then we opened the battle box, which I do want to say, I'm going to showcase something here at the very end. I did figure something out. Uh, We opened up the battle box. You can check that out, battlebox.com. And you can order a battle box for uh, every month for a monthly subscription, get all kinds of random stuff. And then talking to Ryan Chin about Optimus Ride and their AI. And uh, coming up, we've got more shows the rest of this week. I know we're going to have Tim from uh, LG on at some point this week. So Tim Alessi, who's going to be hopping on one of our episodes, and tomorrow we'll be back here live at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Okay, I had to prove it. I figured out how to open the knife. There it is. I got the knife open, so I'm feeling pretty proud of myself right now. Uh, but you can check out the Battle Box and that review. That I need to get that away from me. Uh, no more knives for the rest of the week. And thanks, everyone, for tuning into Digital Trends, tuning into our live show. We will be back tomorrow with a brand new episode of bringing you all kinds of tech headlines and interviews right here with Digital Trends Live. Thank you.